Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning to our worship as we have gathered here on this first day of November on this All Saints Day. We are glad that you are with us this morning. Um, do ask you to take note of the announcements that have been printed in the information you have received and on the screen. Uh, Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes are out in the uh, uh, concourse area, so we invite you to take a shoebox or two uh, and fill it with gifts for children. Um, and uh, those boxes are due Sunday, November 15th. And uh, there's an insert, it's time for Christmas poinsettias, so we invite you to fill out that form. Uh, to uh, order your poinsettias for Christmas, and that is also due on Sunday, November 15th. Uh, take note of the insert, the Election Day Prayer Guide. Thanks to Lindsay Funtick for uh, creating that and making that up. And so we invite you on Election Day this Tuesday to, to if you, if you uh, feel called to fast in some way, whether it's from food or social media or something like that, and then there's a guide there that we invite you to follow in your prayers on election day. Uh, we are having a drive-by visitation at noon today, so we are inviting folks to uh, join us in, in a line of cars as we drive by the homes, the, the places of uh, shut-ins, certain others from our church family who have been shut in, so that we might wave to them and let them know we're still thinking about them and that they're important to us uh, in this time of isolation. So we invite you uh, if you are able to join us at noon for that. Um, our trunk or treat that we had scheduled for Thursday night, because that's when the city had down here trunk or treat, was uh, canceled because of the rain, uh, which would not let up, as you know, all day Thursday. And so we got lots of candy to give away. Gee, isn't that awful? So, uh, when you leave this morning, you will see certain persons dressed as pirates uh, on your way out and get some candy. You can get some candy for yourself, get some candy for your neighbors uh, or family and give them to them and say, here, this is from Ashland First United Methodist Church uh, and, and offer them uh, some candy. So, please do that on the way out. One more announcement. We want to let you know that our business, uh, our office administrator, Brenda Harper, uh, was with family members recently who were exposed to COVID. So Brenda is self-isolating. Uh, she will be home until the family members get back their test. Hopefully, they have been tested. They're just waiting for the results. Hopefully, it won't be more than a couple days. That they'll come. They'll be tested negative, and she'll be able to come back. But in the meantime, she will be uh, quarantining at home. She has uh, all kinds of things that she's able to. She's been able to take home and do work there. But we just want to let you know that at least for at least for tomorrow, maybe Tuesday. Uh, until they get the test back, she, she will be quarantining at home. Lindsay and I will be here tomorrow morning, uh, and there should be somebody here every morning this week. So if you need to do any business in the office, uh, the morning would be the good time. And as soon as, as, soon as Brenda is back, we will let you know that, that she is here. But please remember her and your family in your prayers. All right, friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for worship.
Please stand and join me in the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in God will be condemned. Join me in the opening prayer. God of the ages, your saints who live in faithful service, surround your throne and offer you praise and worship both night and day. May we, your saints on earth, 
join our voices with theirs to proclaim your rule of righteousness and peace, which comes to us through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. God has promised, Christ prepares it, there on high our welcome waits. Every humble spirit shares it, Christ has passed the eternal gate. Let us pray. Lord God, now as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed, we ask that you would open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive your truth. We lift our prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the living word. Amen. This first reading comes from the book of Revelations, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know, he said to me, these people have come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore, 
No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Let us hear these words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountain. He sat down and his disciples came to him. He taught them, saying, Happy are people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve because they will all be made glad. Happy are people who are humble because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace because they will be called God's children. Happy are people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. Many years ago, the director of the Institute for Child Behavioral Research, Bernard Rimland, did an interesting study on the golden rule, as we call it, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he found in his research that the happiest people are those who help others. Now. We might be surprised and say, you know, you got to do a study to conclude that. Well, actually, yeah, because sometimes in our culture, we're not taught that, that happiness is not the result of helping others. The persons involved in the study were asked to list 10 people that they knew really well, they had to know them really, really well, and to label them as happy or not happy. And then they went through the list again, and they were to label each person as selfish or unselfish. And the, here was the def definition of unselfishness, or, or I'm sorry, the definition of selfishness. A stable tendency to devote one times and resources to one's own interests and welfare, an unwillingness to inconvenience oneself for others. All the people who labeled the people they had named as happy were clearly those who made time for others, assisted others in need, and were not put out by having to inconvenience themselves. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, we talk about happiness. Our, our reading this morning from the Beatitudes from the Common English Bible says, happy are those, traditionally we use the word blessed, but our translation says happy are those, and I got to say I'm not quite happy with that translation of happy. Uh, because happy for us in the 21st century West means a feeling right? Everything's going well. The Browns beat the Bengals last week, right? And you know, you get to see the grandchildren, and there's just a lot of good things that happen. You won the publisher's clearinghouse. <laughs> I'm just throwing stuff out here. And you're happy. It's a feeling. But that's not what Jesus has in mind here. Happy To be happy is good, obviously. But this word isn't about a feeling, it's about a state, it's about a condition, it's about a disposition. And so, I have to confess, I prefer the term blessed, blessed. Because you and I, we all know that we can be having a rough patch in life, 
because it happens to all of us. We could be having a rough, rough patch in life, but we think to ourselves, but you know, I'm still blessed, right? I'm still blessed. So I like this word, blessed. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, talks about what it means to be blessed. And the blessings, not all, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them aren't usually what we think of when we think of being blessed, right? Um, blessed are, our translation has hopeless, I don't like that one either. Um, blessed are the poor in spirit, that's better. Blessed are those who know, I mean, poverty, if being poor is not something we think of as being blessed, isn't that right? And Jesus isn't saying, go out and seek poverty, and then you'll be blessed. No, no. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who find yourselves in the midst of a condition where you are dependent upon God for everything. Blessed are those who know that spiritually they need God. They're dependent. Blessed are those who, when they say, give us this day our daily bread, they really mean it because they don't know where their bread's coming from. It's not that poverty is good. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, blessed are those who know their need for God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And notice, something I want you to notice, all of these blesseds are in the present tense. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. It's present tense, not, not past tense, not future tense. But notice, all of the rewards that Jesus mentions afterwards, except for the first and the last one, are in the future tense. So, for those of you who are poor in spirit now, yours is the kingdom of heaven now. Blessed are you who, when you're being persecuted for my sake, yours is the kingdom of heaven now, but all the rest of them are in the future. Blessed are those who grieve, who mourn, because you will be made glad. Uh -huh. Maybe not glad in the moment, but God will make it right. Blessed are you who are meek, who are humble, who are gentle, because you will inherit the earth. This is a promise to all who suffer, to all who have justice denied. God will make it right. God will make it right in, in God's own time. God will make sure those who have been treated unjustly will receive justice. God will make sure that those who have been not been treated with mercy will receive it, will receive mercy. God will make it right. So, you know, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I've said for some time is that if you read the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and you're not disturbed by a fair chunk of it, you, you either have reached a state of perfection that I haven't reached, or you've read it wrong. <laughs> you haven't really read it, because it can be just, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I got to tell you what, in my experience, the people who attempt to be peacemakers when, when emotions are running high and there's a lot of anger, the people who are called peacemakers, well, the people who are peacemakers get called lots of stuff, but the children of God isn't one of them, usually. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You remember last week, the, the Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy, when Moses dies, and what, is, what does the writer say? Moses knew God face to face, which is something most people don't get to do in this life, because you can't see the holiness of God face to face and live, but Moses did. And now here is Jesus saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God. Purity is not necessarily something that people who live for the weekends want to pursue. 
But here it is. Blessed are you. Jesus' words are very instructive for us on how we as disciples are to live in the world. They also serve, I think, sometimes as a challenge because when we don't live up to these, um, and I'll confess, I'll confess to not having always lived up to them. But living the blessed life, what it means to be blessed, living this kind of life is really important. You know, the gospel reading today ends at verse 12. But as soon as Jesus is over pronouncing the blessed nature of, of the kingdom citizen, he goes right into this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and then gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. In other words, we cannot dismiss the character of the kingdom citizen here that Jesus gives to us as some ideal that we possibly can't uh, live up to in this life. Some have said that. That's how they've interpreted this. It's an ideal we strive for, but we can't live up to it. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus uses the present tense. You are. Blessed are you who are. And why is this important, Jesus says? Because how are people going to know? The God you worship, if we don't reflect the blessed character of following Jesus. We are called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The problem has been so often we haven't been that because sometimes the world lures us into its values and its perspectives, all in the name of what's good. I want to read to you from a theologian named Tom Wright who writes about this and writes about how Jesus' problem with his own people, Israel, was that they weren't being salt and light, and that's why he offers the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says. I'm going to quote him. It's fairly long, but I think it's a good quote. He says, Israel was behaving like everyone else with its power politics, its factional, factional squabbles, its militant revolutions. How could God keep the world from going bad if Israel, his chosen salt, had lost its distinctive taste? And in the same way, God called Israel to be the light of the world. Israel was the people for whom God intended to shine his bright light into the darkest places of the world to enable people to find their way. But what if people called to be light bearers had become part of the darkness? And that was Jesus' warning and also his challenge. Jerusalem was the city set on a hill and was supposed to be a beacon of hope to the world. The people of God were to be like that. Their deep, heartfelt keeping of God's laws would be assigned to the nations around the one God, the Creator, the God of Israel, and that that God was indeed God, and that they should worship this God alone. But Jesus found that his people were not being light, not being salt. And so the question for us as the followers of Jesus today, to God's people, the church, that's, our, that's, that's the challenge we have, is are we the salt, are we the light that Jesus has called us to be? If we do not embrace this blessed character of uh, being a kingdom citizen, how is the world going to know that there is another way, that there is a better way? The uh, late basketball coach, Dean Smith, in, in uh, uh, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, said, the Sermon on the Mount will either make us better disciples or better liars.
How are we to offer that distinctive alternative in the world? So Tuesday's an election day, um, and allow me just for a moment to get political but not partisan, okay? We got an election coming up. I'm guessing most of us, maybe most of us have already voted. I don't know, Carol and I voted a couple of weeks ago, or maybe you're going to vote. And it's good. It's a good thing we get to uh, vote, we get to express our opinion, it's a good thing we live in a context where we can have uh, free expression and all the things that we get to talk about. There are places in the world, you know, where people are afraid to do that, and that's a good thing that we've got that. It's a wonderful gift. But we also know that right now we live in a culture, a context that is very divided, right? We know that politically. I think, I think I've never seen a division in my lifetime like this. Now, there's been other times we've been divided. I'll bet this country was really divided just before the Civil War, <laughs> long enough that we had a war over it. And I remember, I remember the uh, reading about the election of 1800, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Boy, was that nasty. The names they called each other. Two things I want to say. First, you can be a good Christian and vote for different candidates. You can be a Christian, a good Christian, and you can vote for Donald Trump. You can be a good Christian and vote for Joe Biden. You can be a good Christian and vote, be a Republican. You can be a Christian and be a Demo good Christian and be a Democrat. You can be a good Christian and be an independent. When I read people who say, how can any good Christian vote for this or that, or, I say, stop. When you and I stand before God on Judgment Day, I will guarantee you one of the questions we will not be asked is whom did you vote for in the election of 2020? <laughs> it's kind of amazing how we reduce Christianity to the good that are our loyalties. And we reject all those things we think are bad. Now, by the way, I'm not saying all candidates are created equal. I'm not saying issues are unimportant. They are. That's why we argue about them and talk about them, and that's why we vote. But that leads to the second thing. We Christians are called to live and transcend above that. And when I say above that, I don't mean, I don't mean withdraw from it. I mean that we are called to model for the world the reconciliation of God in Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so I don't know what's going to happen, and none of us do. I don't know who's going to win the election. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to be before we know. I mean, they're telling us we're not going to know Tuesday night. I'm guessing that's probably true. And we know the next few weeks may very well be, I'll just use the word, interesting. But here's what we need to do as God's people. We need to be the reconcilers, and we need to model the reconciliation of the world. I hope we as the Christian church, and I speak, I speak nationally, I hope we as the Christian church, in the wake of the election post, we don't get down dirty into the mud with, with, with the insults and, and, and just reflect and parrot what everybody else out there is parroting. I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on. What we want to do is come together and show what reconciliation looks like. To show what it means to be one people, one body, even though some of us are not going to get the election results we wanted. And some are. You know, we celebrate communion this morning. And if there, if there is one practice that reflects the unity of God's people more than anything, in spite of all of our diversity, it's when we take that one cup and we take from that one piece of bread. We say, yes, we have one Lord, not two, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's the text for next week, by the way, from Paul. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we're going to remember these seven saints in a few moments. 
you and I know we're not here to remember them because of their political affiliation. We're not here to remember them because of who they voted for. We remember them because they reflected the blessed character of the Christian life. Not perfectly, but neither do we. We remember them and thank God for them because without them, we could not go on with our labors. And so we're going to have communion today to signify our, our connection to the church eternal, to the church in heaven, but also to reflect the unity that we all have in Jesus Christ that transcends all partisan loyalties. And next week, even though it's not our custom here, we're going to come back after the election next Sunday. Will we know who's a winner? I don't know. But whether we do or whether we don't, we're going to come here next Sunday. We're going to have communion again. Because we are going to remind ourselves, after what will be a tumultuous week, we're going to remind ourselves we are one body in Christ. That's ultimately, friends, what matters. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we do live in a in a country, in a place where we have freedom, where we get to vote and choose our leaders, where we can express views that maybe are not popular with others, where we can continue to debate, and these are important matters, they're not irrelevant. But sometimes, perhaps, we will confess, maybe we let them get too central, and if we're not careful, they can undermine our witness, they can, they can hinder us from being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Forgive us when, then, when that's happened, but help us in this time, in these divided times, in these difficult times, to be the ambassadors of reconciliation you have called us to be. Help us in our life and in our witness to demonstrate to the world your ways so that they too might be attracted to this blessed life this blessed life that is the kingdom of God. Thank you, gracious God, for the church, for the one church, different in many ways, diverse in many ways, but one church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We thank you for that. And may we reflect the one church in our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we are now going to remember in this time on this All Saints Day, and All Saints Day is November 1st, uh, and so we are here to remember seven persons who were loved and cherished and cared for by so many, and even though we miss them, even though we grieve their absence, we rejoice that they are now in the eternal presence of God and that they share in that eternal light, and for that we are grateful. But it is, it is good and important that we spend a few min minutes to remember them before God and thank them. So uh, at this time, I'm just going to ask us to uh, let's bow and have some silent prayer. Thank God for the life of these persons we now remember before God. Let us pray silently. O oh God of all the saints, we are grateful for those whose faith journey in this life has ended. 
and we are thankful for their journey because we know their journey makes our journey in this life a little bit easier. We're grateful for that. And we're grateful that they are now in your presence and enjoying knowing you face to face. And we look forward to that time when we will join them and be together forever and all eternity, never to be separated again. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let us now join together in our prayer. Um, let me, um, let, as we now, um, let me, sorry about that, let me now read the names, and as the names are read, a candle will be lighted in their memory and a bell will toll. Uh, and let us say a, a, a silent prayer for each one as their names are read. All right. Carol Barnes. Dorothy Bender. Donald Herr. Carlton Emmons. Verla Long. Sandra Grindle. Capitola Cappy Stone. Friends, let us now join together in our prayer. O God of both the living and the dead, whose love knows no ending, whose power transcends all limits of time and space, we praise your holy name for all your servants who have run the race and kept the faith and won the crown. We pray that encouraged by their example and strengthened by their fellowship, we may be partakers with them in the inheritance of the saints in light. We pray this depending on the grace and trusting in the promise of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, as we now sh go into our time of, of joys and concerns, let us, of course, remember the families of these persons that we remember this day, that God will give them uh, his comfort and care. Let us also remember Kay Irvine, uh, Jason, who is a friend of Janet Folk, uh, who is uh, tested positive for COVID. I uh, would also like to add to that, some of you may know from social media, but Jake Heskett, who is the, was the pastor at Polk, and uh, Nankin, before moving in July to be the associate at uh, North Canton Faith, he too was tested positive for COVID this week. So please remember him in your prayers. Uh, for George Ann Stevenson, daughter of Janet Durs, having tests. For Donnie, who is Jenny Boyer's uncle. For Randy McQuaid, who uh, had an infection in his foot and uh, was in the hospital for uh, a few days, now is, is home recovering. Bud Reeder, who remains at Samaritan Hospital, uh, and just, of course, be in prayer this week for uh, the nation as we uh, have an election, and, and uh, just, uh, just ask God to uh, give his uh, peace and healing presence in the, midst of, in the midst of everything that will transpire in this week. All right, friends, let us now pray silently, offering these requests as well as any personal confessions before God. Let us pray. Gracious God, hear our prayers, our prayers of thanks, our prayers of petition, 
our prayers of confession. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, hear these words of invitation. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come, all things are now ready. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in mystery to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And just before we join together in singing the Lord's Prayer, let us join our confession and pardon in the bulletin. It's printed in the bulletin. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let us now offer prayer, silent prayers of peace for those around us. Amen. Now, friends, let us meditate upon um, the words of the song that Ryan and Sandy are going to sing, and then we will join together in singing the Lord's Prayer.
each time you do remember Friends, now with the confidence of the children of God, let us lift our uh, voices in song uh, as we uh, sing the Lord's Prayer together. Friends, I invite you now to take the elements, and as we take the bread, let us remember that this is the body of Christ given for us. Let us take and eat in the knowledge that Christ died for us, that Christ lives for us, and be thankful.
Now as we take the cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for us. Let us take and drink in the knowledge that Christ died for us, that Christ lives for us, and be thankful. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant now that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all the people said, amen. Let us now stand for our closing hymn. saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Oh, when you raise us from the tomb. Oh, when you raise us from the tomb. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. Oh, when you raise us from the tomb. Oh, in the new Jerusalem. Oh, in the new Jerusalem. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. In the new Jerusalem. Oh, when all tears, oh, when all tears, you wipe away, you wipe away. Oh, when all tears, you wipe away. Lord, I want to be in that number. When you wipe away. Oh, when you make all things new, oh, all things new. Oh, when you're making all things new, oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. When you're making all things new, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want Amen. <laughs> Friends, the saints have marched in, and it's time for us saints to march out. To march out into the world to reflect the blessed character of the Christian life, to reflect the ways of God in this world that we might be salt and light to a world that needs seasoned, to a world that needs light and darkness. So let us go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 